Let's get back to that dramatic news today on The Voice with the Shadow Attorney-General and Shadow Minister for Indigenous Australians, Julian Lisa, quitting the Shadow Cabinet so he can campaign for The Voice. Even though Lisa will continue to push the government to make changes to allay the concerns of some critics, his resignation and pro-voice stand is a blow to the no case, fuelling Liberal Party divisions on the issue and boosting the Yes campaign. Julian Lisa has shown real strength today. He's put his principles first. He's put his principles ahead of partisan politics. Uh, and I suspect these Liberals will not be the last to break from Mr Dutton's partisan narrow position. And Julian Lisa joins me in the studio now. Julian, commiserations, I suppose, uh, on resigning from your front bench spot, but congratulations on a principled stand. Good to be with you, Chris. Um, look, I, I decided uh, after the party room decision the other day that the party room and I had a different view on these matters. Uh, I've wanted to campaign yes and vote yes uh, on The Voice for a long time. I've got a long history of this. Uh, back in 2014, I worked with Indigenous leaders and constitutional conservatives to find a way forward on constitutional recognition, and that was about putting the voice in the constitution. I set up an organisation called Uphold and Recognise to encourage constitutional conservatives to get involved in this. I co-chaired a joint committee on constitutional recognition with the Labor Senator, Pat Dodson. So I really wanted to see this through to the end, and uh, I respect the decision of the party room. And one of the things about being in the Liberal Party is that shadow ministers um, are bound by the decisions of the party room and the shadow cabinet, um, but backbenchers are free to champion the issues that they want to. So I wanted to champion this issue, yep. uh, so, so I made the decision to, to step down. So you're going to campaign for the yes case in the referendum. Then why is the Liberal Party's opposition to the voice wrong? Well, I'm going to campaign for the yes case, but there's some work to do before that, Chris. Uh, for the next six weeks, we've got a parliamentary committee on, and as I've said, I think it's important that we actually look at amending the words that the government's put forward. Um, we want to make three three different sorts of amendments. The first is to get the government to commit to the local and regional bodies. That's the position of the coalition. Um, that was the position we took to the last election. It was a recommendation of the Calma Langton report, which you, you served on. Um, I think it's fundamental to get those local and regional bodies out there to ensure the national body is well connected. And you also want to get rid of the second clause uh, so that there's no reference to executive government and no issue about the matters relating to Indigenous affairs. Leave all that to the parliament. That's right. But in the end, you would support it even as as it is. So why is yes, the coalition now, the, the Nationals and the Liberals, why is their opposition to The Voice wrong? It's not that it's wrong, it's just that they've got a different view about this. Um, I think you have to see where the common ground is. It's common ground that you've pointed out many times on this program. Uh, both uh, the Coalition and Labor support the idea of consultative bodies. The Coalition thinks that there should be local and regional bodies uh, and, that, and, and that they are the sort of bedrock of this. Uh, the Government um, is more interested in a national body and they're interested in, in the Constitution. The Coalition's position is it supports constitutional recognition but not the voice in the Constitution. I think there's nothing wrong with the voice being in the Constitution. Uh, I think it gives the body security. I think it's consistent with our Constitution, which establishes institutions. Um, but what I think we can do here, because support for this is not where it should be, it's about 54% today, I don't think that's enough to win a referendum. I think the government needs to move, and I think it needs to address the concerns of people about the Constitution, and that means removing that second clause that relates to executive government and matters relating to. You outlined that at the press club uh, a couple of weeks ago. Why didn't you and Peter Dutton then, I'm certain you must have tried to get him to do this, an offer to the government that if they would adopt these changes, then they would get bipartisan support. Well, Chris, my criticism of the government right throughout this has been a lack of proper process. Um, there was never a process where we could actually just come together and look at the different range of models that were on the table. We but called you could for have put it out there and said, if you make these changes, you will get bipartisan. Support. Well, Chris, we called for a proper process to, to put a whole range of different models on the table, including things that have been set by Frank Brennan and Louise Clegg and the 18 different models that Pat Dodson and I saw. The government didn't go down that, that path. We asked them to respond formally to Calma Langton to outline what they do with the local and regional. They didn't go down that path. How we close asked did them... you get to convincing Peter Dutton and your colleagues to supporting the Yes case? Look, I think the first thing to say is Peter Dutton came to this with an open mind. He genuinely did. Um, he appointed me as the Shadow Minister. That uh, is, the, is the best down payment that you could see of him having an open mind. He went out and met people in community and tried to understand the issues that, that, that confront them. 
So I think he really looked, as our party did, and grappled with this. Um, we have many members of our party who represent very large Aboriginal constituencies. Indeed, we have Indigenous members of our, of our parliamentary party as well. But ultimately, um, the, the vote on this was over... It wasn't a vote, but the view in the party room on, on this was overwhelming. So you didn't get close? Well, as I said, it was uh, the, the position that the Coalition has taken has had overwhelming support. And as a result, I've made my decision that I want to campaign yes, so I've stepped down from the front bench to move to the back bench. Well, let me show you a little bit of what Peter Dutton said in his press conference today after you resigned. Have a look. The form of words that the Prime Minister has on the table at the moment will see our system of government change dramatically from what we've known in our entire lifetime. Now, is he right there or is he exaggerating just how big this change will be, changing the whole form of government in this country? Well, there are people that have doubts about the form of words that the government has put up and that's why I'm going to spend the next six weeks um, campaigning to get those words changed to remove the second clause which deals with executive government and with relation to the scope of matters it can advise on and to remove the symbolic clause which can lead... Is that because you matters. think there really is a risk with those words or because you want to protect the voice from, or the referendum yes case, from the attacks like we've just seen from Peter Dutton? Look, this should be a moment where we're trying to find common ground, Chris, and I think, uh, you know, basically a take-it-or-leave-it approach um, won't lead to a successful referendum. All right, let me show you uh, something else that Peter Dutton said today. And we believe that our policy unites the country, doesn't divide it. Is he right there? Is Peter Dutton right to say that opposition to the voice unites the country while supporting the voice divides it? Well, I think he's right to say that the idea of local and regional bodies, which is part of the, uh, the, the coalition's platform, uh, does unite the country because... You know, as I've travelled around, and I've tra whether it's been with Peter or by myself, um, the problems that Indigenous people face and the challenges are in community, they're sure, not so much in Canberra. But surely opposing a voice for Indigenous Australians and saying that it's racially divisive for the country, surely that's not uniting the country, surely that's dividing the country. Well, look, the government has chosen to go ahead with a referendum without bipartisan support on this occasion. Um, I think Peter is offering another way with, a, with an alternative uh, proposal in relation to constitutional recognition, and it's a matter for the government as to whether they want to take that up. Well, let the me government put it, doesn't let seem me put like... this way, Julian Lisa. Do you believe the, the yes case, the, the passage of the referendum, will unite the country, or would defeating the referendum unite the country? Chris, I'm working to see the uh, the, the success of this referendum because, because I've got a you long... Because you think it will unite the country? Because I've got a long history in this and because I think it will improve Indigenous outcomes. But what I'm also looking to do, Chris, is to try and build some common ground to take out of this debate uh, some of the issues that, that are of c concern to people uh, on the political right. Do you think that some of the no advocates have been unnecessarily alarmist and divisive? Look, I think we're going to hear a range of different views on, on The Voice. I think the important thing is that, yes, advocates like you and I acknowledge the reasonable concerns of people who doubt, and those people who are no advocates acknowledge the hopes and aspirations of Indigenous people for The Voice. And I think we need to conduct this debate in a civil fashion. Well, let's talk about whether yes advocates have gone too far. There's been some horrible language and personal attacks, and one of them came the other day, last week, actually, from Noel Pearson, and he was discussing the issue of how people prove their indigeneity for the purposes of The Voice, and he singled you out and said this. Have a look. You know, I first heard the opposition spokesman, Julian Lisa, say that, Anna, and I was just completely confounded by it. Because I'm wondering whether Julian expects us to wear a tattoo identifying ourselves as Indigenous. Is that what he's saying? Or that our clothes should be adorned with some kind of badge identifying us as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander? I think it's a completely dangerous idea and suggestion and extremely offensive. It's an extraordinary analogy for anyone to use any time, but especially given that you're Jewish. Uh, what's your response to Noel Pearson's claims there? I was very disappointed in Noel's claims. Um, he made those remarks um, during Passover. In fact, the time he was making those remarks, I was taking my son to the synagogue. That's not the sort of debate we should be conducting. I think it's important that those people who are advocating yes 
do understand the concerns and queries of people who doubt, and that's certainly how I'll be um, conducting myself in this referendum campaign. You say you want the Liberal Party to succeed and win government and Peter Dutton to be Prime Absolutely. Minister. How will the Liberal Party and the Coalition be able to do that if this referendum passes, as you want it to pass, against their wishes? They're campaigning no. Won't the Coalition be in an awful position politically if the referendum succeeds? No, this is, this is one issue. And I think uh, if the referendum succeeds, I'm sure that the coalition will play a constructive role in the legislative process for the establishment of the national voice body. Uh, we always respect the verdict of the Australian people. Um, I'm trying to find a way that we can get to common ground over the next period so more Australians will look to support the referendum as I do. Do you think the referendum will succeed? Look, I want it to succeed. I do think the numbers are too weak at this stage and I think the government has to move on its amendments and that's why I'm proposing the Press Club model. Julian Lisa, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Chris. It's going to be a complicated and testy debate for the next six months, but the beauty is, uh, in the end, it's just uh, you and me, all of us in the privacy of the uh, voting booth, uh, we get to uh, make the decision in the end. We'll see how it all goes, hey?